Are you ready? Here we go. See everyone. Love God. I love being able to do this because you get your hands up in the air. Some of you the first time. Wave around like you don't care. Good. All right. Love people. Put your arm around somebody or around yourself and squeeze. Yeah. Feel the love, baby. Just feel it. It's good. All right. And then lock arms with somebody. Do something about it. All right. Let's do it. Here we go. Really fast. Ready? See everyone. Love God. Love people. Do something about it. All right. Good. Sit down. Nice job. Nice job. Y'all go home and teach that to somebody. Uh, tell somebody about it uh, because it is the mission that God has given us. It is, it is really just, what, like I said, it's just the putting together of words that helps us understand what it is. Matthew 22, Matthew 28 is God is calling us to go and to make disciples. And this is what it's about, seeing everyone love God, love people, do something about it. Our prayer is, is that it would penetrate your heart and that you become to come to realize that that as it transforms your heart God wants to use you to transform other people's lives by the power of Jesus Christ at work in you and and the beauty of that is is that as we do it God he molds and shapes our heart he gets a hold of our heart and he does a work that only he can do in our heart and the beauty of it is is our life reflects that heart I love this verse, Proverbs 27, 19. As water reflects the face, so one's life reflects their heart. Think about that. The way you live reflects your heart. Things you say, the way you act, the way you react, it, it is a mirror, it is a reflection of your heart. And God wants to transform your heart. God wants to get a hold of your heart. God wants you to surrender your heart to Him because He can do more than you can ever begin to even think or imagine if you'll just let Him. Seeing everyone love God, love people, that's all about surrendering our heart to Him because honestly, you'll never see everyone the way Christ sees them if you don't surrender your heart to Christ. You'll never love God the way that God intends for you to love Him if you don't surrender your heart to him you'll never love people like God wants you to love people if you don't surrender your heart to him and you certainly won't do something about it if you've never given your life to Jesus you've never put your trust your faith in him I'm not talking about religion I'm talking about relationship religion is is a bunch of do's and don'ts and some list that I got to check off a relationship is a a living breathing thing that as we draw near to one another. We grow in that relationship. God loves you and longs for you to love him. And the more that you love him, the more that you fall in love with him, the more you want to do something about it. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, one of our memory verses that we've talked about several times is as the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you, when does that happen? That happens the moment you put your faith and trust in Jesus. As the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be his witness. You will be his witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and most parts of the world. It doesn't say you might be. It doesn't say you could be. It says you will be a witness for Jesus everywhere you go. Everywhere you go, you will be a witness of Jesus. That word witness in the original language is actually where we get the word martyr from. What, what is a martyr? A martyr is someone who willingly gives their life as they live out their faith. A, a martyr, someone who, who like Stephen, who was stoned to death by, by Paul and by others, they, he was living out his faith. Living out his faith. Yes, his life was taken this life here on this earth, but the reality that we know is, is that life doesn't end here. Life is eternal, and the moment Stephen closed his eyes in this life, he opened in the very presence of his Savior, his Lord Jesus, because he had put his faith and trust in Jesus, and his desire was, no matter what would come his way, I'm going to live my life for Jesus. I, I'm, gonna, I'm going to fall more and more and more in love 
with Jesus because there's no greater thing that I can do in my life than to love Jesus Christ. I, I have five kids, and, and, I, and I, yes, am concerned about what they're going to do with their life. What, what direction are they going to go? If they're going to get married, if they're going to go to school, if they're going to do all that stuff. But here's what I know. The greatest thing that those five kids can do is not choose a college or choose a wife or a husband. The, the greatest thing they can do is choose to follow and love Jesus. Because as they follow and love Jesus, God will direct them to where he wants them to go. God will direct them to the person that he wants them to be in relationship with. God will direct them in every facet of their life. What my desire more than anything else is that my children would fall in love with Jesus. Not, not get wrapped up in all the hype of theology and all the hype of, uh, of this, that, and the other thing and worry about all of that stuff that we as adults like to really mess up Christianity and mess up faith with. Because we think, oh, well, we got to get really deep in the faith. Except that Jesus says, those that will enter the kingdom of heaven have a childlike faith. And so, so I don't know why it is that we think we need to add more and add more and add more to our faith in order to somehow be acceptable to God when it's not even based on us at all. It's based on Jesus and whether or not I know and have a relationship with Jesus. So the greatest thing I can do is fall in love with Jesus Christ more and more and more every day. And the reality is, is that I will not fall in love with him enough ever in my entire lifetime it's always something that I'm striving to do more and more and more in my life. That's true. Think about it, of every relationship. I mean, the, the relationships that don't work out is because we stop trying. We, st we stop working at it. Either a, the other person or ourself. And, and here's what I know about God. He's never going to give up on you. Ever. He'll never stop loving you. He will always be pursuing you. The question isn't whether or not God will. The question is, will I fall more and more in love with him? Will I pursue him? Will I obey him? Will I do what I need to do as I strive to follow him? You will be my witness. Really doing something about it is just that. It's living out your faith. Living out your faith. Living out your relationship with Jesus. Jesus even says it over and over again. Matthew 22, love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Again, not suggestions. Those are commands. Matthew 28, go, make disciples of all nations. Acts chapter 1, you will be my witnesses. Luke chapter 10, do this and you will live. Go and do likewise. These are all these are all commands that Jesus is giving. Why? Because in John 14, verse 15, he says, if you love me, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. If you love me, you'll, you'll do as I'm telling you to do. And, and the beauty that, that we understand is, is that Jesus tells us these things because he has our best in mind. He has our, our best in mind as he as he gives us these instructions, as he gives us these commands, he longs for us to experience his best. And so what's his best? His best is if we love him, we'll keep his commands. Jesus, as he's talking to his disciples, he said, if you want to follow me, Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, he said, if you, if you would come after me, if you want to follow after me, here's three things. Let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. I'm not going to get into a real serious, in-depth, uh, what each of those mean. Here's what they mean, simple terms. Deny yourself. If you want to follow Jesus, you have got to be willing to say no to you. No to yourself. I, no to your desire. No to what you want. No to, to what you feel. No to whatever it is that stands in direct opposition to God. And I don't know about you, I know in my life there's lots of times where if I'm not willing to deny myself, I am going to do something that is going to be sin against God. Why? Why? Because I'm a, I'm a human being. 
and I, and I make bad choices. And, 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 uh, and this past weekend, that was brought again to my attention as I'm driving into Chicago. Anybody else you just love it? Oh, I love driving into Chicago. Anyone love driving into Chicago? If you do, we need to lay hands on you and exercise a demon. I don't know. But, no, seriously, I, it is horrible driving. And the older I get, it's like, dude, this is messed up. Like, these people, what? And, and, uh, and I find myself thinking and wanting to do things that I know God is not directing me to do. <laughs> Y'all understand, you understand what I'm saying? I got to say no to self. That's just one example. I'll give you a hundred others. No to self. You want to follow Jesus? No to yourself. Take up your cross. And one of the other gospel writers adds daily. Take up your cross. What, what is that? Jesus willingly picked up his cross and carried it to Calvary. It is a willing saying yes to God's will in your life. So, so what is it? Denying self, no. No to self. Taking up your cross, yes to God. You want to follow Jesus? You have got to be willing to say yes to God no matter what it is. Do you think Jesus enjoyed taking up the cross? Do you think Jesus enjoyed all that he endured up to the cross and then getting nailed to a cross? Do you think he, he, he thought that was, oh, well, this is just awesome. No. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he is praying and, and, and he is sweating droplets of blood, which is an, an actual, actual thing that can happen due to stress and due to, to, to just... Uh, pressure mentally and, and emotionally and spiritually on an individual to the point that he's asking his father, God, is there another way that this can be done? I, I don't, he knows what's coming. And he's asking his father, Father, is there another way? But then he says something that, that every single one of us has to learn to say, not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. Take up your cross is willingly choosing to obey God. Third thing he says is follow me. Well, if you're going to follow Jesus, it only makes sense that you would have to follow him. He goes left, you go left. He goes right, you go right. He stands up, you stand up. He sits down, you sit down. It's just like playing follow the leader. If you want to follow Jesus where he leads you, you have to go. Whatever, whatever he leads you into, you have to go. And, and Jesus would lead his disciples into a life that they never thought possible, and he would use them to do immeasurably more than they could ever ask or even imagine. By the way, that's in the Bible, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. He, he leads them to do something far beyond what they can ever imagine or even think, and almost every single one of them lose their life because of it. But they did it willingly. And you and I sit here today because they were willing to follow Jesus, who was willing to lay down his life for another. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for another. Jesus was the ultimate example, the first example of that lays down his life for others, his disciples follow, and you and I, by, dis by extension, as disciples, are to follow him and follow them as we strive to live for him. If you have your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 2. I just want to share with you a, sh a short story from Mark chapter 2 and also from my life and how this all connected for me. I went through junior high and high school not living for Jesus whatsoever. It was all about me, all about self, all about what I want, all about how I want to get it. And I went through all of junior high and high school making zero difference for the kingdom of God because of myself. 
And in 1992, January of 1992, I came face to face with that reality that I was living for myself. We were in a missions conference at Cedarville. The whole story of getting to Cedarville is in and of itself crazy because I was not living for God at all. The only reason I went to Cedarville was because when I visited there, the people were nice. And I thought, eh, I'll go to school there. That's a terrible reason. I mean, maybe it's not. I mean, God used it. But uh, there might be some better ways to, to pick a college. But anyway, so I get to Cedarville. I get to see God on display and people around me living for Jesus. I met Daisha, who is my wife now, and she was living for Jesus. And I saw, I saw in them what it meant to live for Jesus. In January of 1992, we had a speaker come in, and he shared this story in Mark chapter 2. When he returned to Capernaum after some days, this is Jesus, it was reported that he was at home, not his home, but at a home. Many were gathered together so there was no room, not even at the door. He was preaching the word to them. So picture this, they're in a house, it's completely packed full of people, so much so there's no room for any more people. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him, who's the him? That's Jesus. Because of the crowd, check this out. You want to talk about knowing got to get your friend to Jesus. Look what they did. They could not get him near, so they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, can you imagine being at your house? And you got somebody there, and everybody's, the room, the place is packed, and all of a sudden you hear noise on your roof. And then sawdust starts hitting you in the face, and somebody is drilling a hole in your roof. That's crazy. But these friends knew they had to get their friend to Jesus. And so they tear off the roof of this dude's house. No, no, oh, is it okay, or, you know, any of that. It's just rip into it, baby, like a Slim Jim, and let's go to town. Let's get this guy to do that. I mean, what is happening? This is crazy. So they rip open the dude's roof. They lower the guy down in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. And what, here's what I was challenged with in that story. He asked this question, are you willing to tear the roof off in order for people to find Jesus? And what I realized is I was not even willing to live for Jesus. I wasn't even willing to, like, Jesus would not be able to look at my faith and tell my friend, your sins are forgiven. Why? Because my faith didn't even exist and I realized in that moment, what I was missing was I had lived a religious life, but never had a relationship with Jesus. And what I needed most of my life at that moment, and still to this day, is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And in that moment, I remember surrendering my life to him and saying, God, I want to do what you want me to do. I want to be in relationship with you. And I can tell you from that moment on, my life has never been the same. He transformed my life, not, in, not into somehow me conforming into a religion more, but into a relationship with Jesus. And as that has blossomed and that has bloomed, and, and has there been hardship, has there been difficult times, has there been disobedience on my part, has there been sin on my part? Yes, but I know he still loves me. And he still picks me up off the ground and brushes me off and sets me back on the road again. And I'm so thankful for a relationship with God. But in that moment, he transformed my life. And you know what happened is, immediately, I wanted to serve him. Immediately, I wanted to do something about it because that's what happens when God comes into your life, the Holy Spirit comes into your life through a relationship with Jesus there is something that should happen in you that says, I want to serve him. I want to obey him. I want to do what he wants me to do. I want to be willing to rip the roof off 
in order for people to see and find Jesus. See, it's, it's all about, and, 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 I, and I give this analogy as baseball because that's what I know, get off the bench and get into the game. If you're not obeying Jesus, if you're not living out your faith, my friend, you are sitting on the bench and you are missing it. You're missing God use you in the gifts that he's given you. You're missing God in the way that he has even given you natural abilities to be able to use for his kingdom, for his glory, for his honor. You're missing the blessing of what it means to serve him and for him to work in and through your life. So get, get off the bench, get into the game, and realize that it's something God wants you to do, not later. God wants you to do now. Why, why do I know that? Because you're not guaranteed tomorrow. I'm not guaranteed tomorrow. Oh, I like to think that I've got tomorrow. I like to think I've got the rest of the day, but I don't know. None of us know the day or the hour or when we're going to come face to face with death. N none of us knows that time. So, so when we tell kids and we tell youth that you're the church of tomorrow, the reality is they're the church of now. You as adults are the church of, of now. We're, we're not guaranteed tomorrow. Now live for him. And, and I, I've gotten to see this play out in so many different ways I remember in college, we had a, there was a girl that was a friend of Daisha and I's, and her brother was eight years old. He was diagnosed with cancer, and, and, and he loved Jesus. And he said, you know what, I, I want to, to lead my friends to Jesus, eight years old. That year that he was diagnosed with cancer, he had the opportunity to lead 30 of his friends to Jesus Christ. 30. As an eight-year-old. Y'all, some, some of you are kids in here. Listen, God can use you now to make a difference for him. Some of you are teenagers in here. Please do not follow my example and not live for Jesus in junior high and high school. You will regret it. Don't do it. Live now for him. That doesn't mean that you gotta, you, again, and I'm not talking about religion, I'm talking about relationship. Love Jesus and let that be seen in your life. Make a difference now. You that are adults, listen, God wants to use you now where you're at. He has you in a place, wherever it is that you're at, and God wants to use you to make a difference now. Now, not, not tomorrow, not later, now. So will you, will you get into the game? Will you get off the bench good friend of mine who's gone home to be with, with Jesus, Rich Wessels. Some of you guys know Rich. Remember Rich? He was one of those guys, man. I, I could call and be like, hey, there's this lady that put me in coach. Man, I wouldn't even get it out of my mouth. I'd be like, hey, there's, put me in coach. He would just say that over and over again to me. And what he meant was, what do you need? I'm there. I'll do it. And he, and he would just, that's the way he lived his life. And yes, as and many of us would know and understand, we would think, man, his life was cut short. But man, in that short amount of time that he lived for Jesus, he made a difference for Jesus more than some adults that lived to be 80, 90 years of age. It doesn't have to be that way. What, what can be that the, the, is the norm is for us to live for Jesus. That's not super Christianity. That's just normal. Just normal life is living for Jesus. Are we willing to, to get off the bench, get into the game? There are so many ways you can do that. There's so many different things you can get involved in. Here at Harvest Time or wherever you go, there are places that you can get involved and be making a difference and realize that you can do something about it. I want to share with you a story about a man. A man that made a difference. A man that lived his life for Jesus. A man that you know what, I'm going to do what I can. I'm going to do something about it. And he did. 1858. Like, whoa. Seems like it, huh? 1858, 
This guy lived in Boston. His name was Edward Kimball. He was a Sunday school teacher. Sunday school teacher, life group leader, whatever you want to call him. <laughs> we call them life groups now. and Well, sometimes still call them Sunday school, but whatever. Sunday school teacher who made it a habit to reach out to his students personally. And he would go on their turf. It wasn't just about them coming to church and you know doing a thing here at church. He would go out wherever they were at, and he would meet them on their turf, and he would share with them about Christ. He would love on them. One of his students worked at a shoe store. And he went to that shoe store, and the young man was in the back stocking shelves, and he went back and started having a conversation with him, and he led him to an understanding of who Christ was and their relationship with Jesus. That young man was Dwight L. Moody. That young man eventually left the shoe business and became one of the greatest evangelists of all time. Moody would travel around the world speaking, sharing Christ. He preached in a little chapel pastored by a young man named Friedrich Meyer. In his sermon, he told the story of his Sunday school teacher. That message changed Pastor Meyer's ministry, inspiring him to become an evangelist like Moody. Meyer eventually preached in America in Northfield, Massachusetts, where a young preacher heard him say, if you are not willing to give up everything for Christ, are you willing to be made willing? That remark led J. Wilbur Chapman to respond to God's call in his life. Wilbur Chapman went on to become an evangelist. He enlisted the help of a volunteer named Billy Sunday, who helped him set up for crusades. Billy Sunday learned how to preach by watching Chapman and eventually took over Chapman's ministry, becoming an evangelist himself. Billy Sunday's preaching brought thousands to Christ. Inspired by a Billy Sunday crusade in Charlotte, North Carolina, a group of Christian men de dedicated themselves to reaching their city for Christ. They invited an evangelist, Mordecai Ham, to come and hold a series of evangelistic meetings. The year was 1932. A local farmer loaded his pickup truck with neighbors and brought them to the meeting. One was a 16-year-old boy who sat in the crowd each night spellbound by the message. Each evening, the preacher seemed to be speaking right to this young man. Night after night, the teenager came, and finally on the last night, he went forward and gave his life to Christ. That teenager was Billy Graham. One guy, Edward, Edward Kimball, science school teacher. Decided, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to go to each one of my kids in my class, and I'm just going to personally connect with them, share with them Jesus. That one act led into a chain event of acts that has led to potentially, I would say, thousands if not millions of people who have put their faith and trust in Jesus. What are you willing to do? That question that, that was asked of me back in 1992, are you willing to tear the roof off in order to peep, for people to find Jesus? Let's, let's leave that, that roof off. Let's leave that out. Are you willing to blank in order for people to find Jesus? What's God telling you? Maybe you're, you're an Edward Kimball who just needs to reach out to the kids that are in in your life group, in your small group. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's your neighborhood. I, I don't know. But what are you willing to do in order for people to find Jesus? Because if we really believe that what this world needs is Jesus, then what we really believe needs to become what we really live. And what we really live needs to be Jesus so that people can see and meet him and have their life changed. So, are you willing to do something about it? I'm going to ask you, would just close your eyes, bow your head. I asked you earlier to pray and ask God, God, speak to my heart. I wonder, what is he saying? What's he telling you? What's God saying to you? What is that thing that you need to be willing, at this moment, in this time, right now, to say, you know what, I'm willing to do this. I'm willing to, to Lord, this is what you're laying on my heart. I'm willing to do it. 
you've heard me say this many times, and I'll, I'll probably, I know I'll say it many more, but my dad always used to say to me, son, you need to do whatever God wants you to do, even if it means being a banana boat driver on the Amazon. What? Uh, 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 are you serious? A banana boat driver on the Amazon? Come on, Dad. What he was getting at was not that I would be called to be a banana boat driver on the Amazon. What he was getting at is you got to go and you got to do whatever it is that God's calling you to do when he's calling you to do it. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to say, yes, God, use me to do that. I want to rip the roof off so that people can come to know Jesus. Maybe you're here today, first thing you realize is, I don't even know Jesus. I don't have a relationship with him. I've been living for myself this whole time, and I need to surrender myself. I need to deny myself. I need to take up the cross, and I need to follow Jesus. I just say that's your first step. That's what you've got to start at. If you've done that, then I would say to you, what are you doing about it? How are you living for Christ right now? God, thank you, thank you that you give us the strength to do whatever it is that you call us to do. You equip us to do the thing that you call us to do. Even though we may think about it and go, how in the world is that possible? Huh. What seems impossible with us as men, with, as people, is possible with you. God, help us in this moment to say yes to you. You're good. Thanks for your love. In Jesus' name.